Hello and welcome to this lecture on uh, Rudyard Kipling's My Own True Ghost Story. I will begin this lecture by giving you a bit of information about Kipling whose reputation is quite complex because of his association with uh, British imperialism. Kipling was born in Mumbai in 1865 and he is the youngest recipient of the Nobel Prize in 1907 and in terms of his reputation as I said it is a bit complex because uh, I have an example of such uh, criticism here. George Orwell in 1942 called him a jingo imperialist because um, Kipling did write uh, uh, works that were uh, indirectly and, and consciously uh, supportive of the British uh, Empire uh, and Orwell here calls him morally insensitive and aesthetically disgusting. And I have um, a few other uh, pieces of criticism about Kipling which tries to bring in other perspectives about him and um, the information that I am going to share with you uh, right now is from uh, the Guardian and here I have a professor uh, emeritus uh, from the University of Kent, uh, Janet uh, Montefiore who was the editor of Kipling's journal. Uh, who says um, that uh, you know Kipling uh, is of course a racist, of course he was an imperialist but that is not all he was and it seems to me a pity to say so. Um, she argues that Montefiore argues that Kipling was a magical storyteller and that his perspective was part of history. So, she says you do not want to pretend that it all did not happen. And Amit Chowdhury is also another critic um, uh, of uh, Kipling and who is a professor of contemporary literature at the University of East Anglia, East Anglia and he says that Kipling is a compelling and very, very gifted writer who had clearly racist prejudices. So, we have two uh, different perspectives emerge about Rudyard Kipling. One is that he is a fantastic, magical storyteller, very powerful storyteller and uh, the other is that he had racist prejudices. So, uh, we will see both these elements come through in the story, my own true uh, ghost story. So, Amit Chaudhary goes on to say, what in a lesser writer would have been predictable is in him very unpredictable in alive. There are great blind spots in Kipling and the blind spots are all the more curious and regrettable because they occur in a writer who is extraordinarily observant and acute in his observation. So, Kipling is uh, extremely observant, fantastically, um, uh, you know, uh, he is a fantastic genius when it comes to observing the life around him, but then he also did have his blind spots, according to Amit um, Chowdhury. So, we need to keep these uh, differing perspectives about him uh, in our minds when we read uh, my own true ghost story. This particular story appeared on 25th February 1888, so late 19th story, short story and it also appeared in um, the fifth volume of the Indian Railway Library and uh, in the collection titled Phantom Rickshaw and Other Eerie Tales. So, the word phantom and eerie should um, uh, tell you that these are gothic uh, in tone or supernatural in tone. And if you look at the illustrations it, it's, it's, uh, it will tell you that it, it is depicting a, a, a brick uh, house which is kind of crumbling and um, it which is suggestive of the central setting uh, of this particular story which is a, a, it's a dark bungalow. Now, I have uh, some information about Walter Besant uh, in this slide here. 
Uh, and the reason I have it uh, here for you is that the story, uh, My Own True Ghost Story by Kipling, begins with a reference to Walter Besant. And Walter Besant uh, is a, uh, a very famous uh, writer he, who, who lived in the Victorian period. And he was uh, one of the most prolific and widely read uh, uh, novelists. And he uh, was also. Um, uh, an author of three volume novels such as Dorothy Foster and Our Moral of Lioness, published in 1890. And um, Besson's novel, All in a Garden Fair, published in 18, 20, 1882, inspired Kipling to leave India and make a career as a writer. So Besson is a figure who is inspirational for Kipling, and he is interesting in that regard for us. Now, to get into the story, it begins um, in a very offhand manner with a reference to Besant, who apparently treats uh, his spiritual stuff flippantly. And then at the end of that uh, light-hearted paragraph, uh, we have this particular statement. Um, and the narrator, this narrator, tells us that you may treat anything uh, from a viceroy to a vernacular paper with levity, but you must behave reverently toward a ghost and particularly an Indian one. Look at the way the ideas are structured in this uh, particular statement. We have a reference to a viceroy. And I have an image of a viceroy here for you, Lord Lansdowne. And he was the viceroy uh, at that period when uh, Kipling's story came out. And uh, he says that, um, you know, you can treat all these aspects such as a viceroy or a vernacular paper, vernacular meaning native, with levity in a light-hearted manner. But you must behave reverently towards a ghost. Look at the way in which these two items are juxtaposed. One is a viceroy, a powerful figure, very, very powerful figure in the British administration of India. And the other is a vernacular paper, a local paper, which probably talked about politics, history, culture, society, and other sorts of um, information. So these are heavy, ponderous um, ideas and uh, people. On the other side, we have this insubstantial thing called the ghost. But apparently, it is this insubstantial thing which is very powerful, more powerful than these two the paper in the viceroy and an Indian one, an Indian ghost should be especially treated with dignity. Should be treated with dignity. Why? Why should we treat an Indian ghost with dignity as against other ghosts, say a British one? That's a question that needs to be thought about because Kipling doesn't give us the answer for that question. Now, in this paragraph, he describes the different kinds of ghosts that populate the Indian landscape. It's a very interesting uh, rundown of the category of ghosts. And I, I, I'm interested in this paragraph because this section covers every kind of ghost. Um, that, are, uh, that were there when Kipling uh, wrote about uh, it in this short story. He says, or his narrator says, there are in this land ghosts who take the form of fat, cold, pobby corpses and hide in trees near the roadside till a traveler passes. Then they drop upon his neck and remain. There are also terrible ghosts of women who have died in childbed. These wander along the pathways at dusk or hide in the crops near a village and call seductively. But to answer their call is death in this world and the next. Their feet are turned backward, 
that all sober men may recognize them. There are ghosts of little children who have been thrown into wells. These haunt well curbs and the fringes of jungles and wail under their stars, wail under the stars, or catch women by the wrist and beg to be taken up and carried. In this section, you see that magical quality of Kipling that these critics, uh, Janet Montefer and Amit Chowdhury were talking about. You also see the very observant Kipling who is um, you know, full of details in his narrative for the benefit of the reader. So that um, awe that we uh, usually associate with Kipling's narrative is also reflected in this particular uh, passage from the story. Now let's, let's take this um, uh, passage very carefully and see what the various categories of ghosts are. Let me uh, find out the first one, ghosts who take the form of fat, cold poppy corpses. Poppy is swollen. swollen corpses and what do these kind of ghosts do? They hide near the roadside waiting for a traveler to pass by and then they jump upon him and they hang on to his neck and remain. So um, they don't uh, let go of him, they stick to him. So um, that's one category. The second category is more terrible. These are women who died in childbirth, the maternity cases. Um, and these women wander alongside alongside pathways and they hide near crops uh, or, or uh, they kind of uh, you know uh, call seductively for the passerby. So look at the word seductively. I wonder why that word is used. Um, and, and, and that's a very disturbing uh, term as well. Uh, women who die in childbirth and the ghosts try to seductively tempt v uh, men who pass by. Are they trying to, uh, you know, um, uh, are they trying to complete the process which was aborted for them in childbirth? So that's, that's, that's an interesting question uh, that can be probed. And the other question is um, that uh, do all uh, women obsess, all women who die in childbirth obsess about this kind of fulfillment is another question and is there an association of Indian women being very seductive in this particular context. So all these m questions proliferate when you think about it. And what do they do? They call seductively to these men and the narrator very helpfully points out that um, you know their feet are turned backward not in the uh, usual forward uh, position but they turn backward and um, all sober men may look at their feet and recognize them. So there are cues, there are cues to identify ghosts and be wary of them and to stay away from them. Then we have another uh, category, so first we saw uh, the fat men who kind of parasitically stick to travelers. Um, the ghost of fat men and then we have women who died in childbirth calling seductively for uh, to the victims, potential victims and then thirdly we have child ghost children who were thrown into wells. Why on earth would we do that? So again there is a puzzle there. So these children who were thrown into wells and died horribly would come back to haunt uh, on you know the well curbs, well curbs, the spaces near the wells and in the fringes of jungle. So they all haunt all these places and they wait under the stars for the uh, for women whom they can grab by their wrist and uh, beg uh, them to be uh, uh, taken up and carried. So it's a very um, you know uh, very very um, a pathetic situation that is being uh, described in association with with child ghosts, with children as ghosts. So we, we have a cross section of the Indian society, I would say. So we have a cross section of the Indian society depicted through the image of ghosts. Uh, and, um, and this is a cross section of the Indian society which is not 
very positive, I would call it dysfunctional. This functional representation of India is what we get through this categorization of the different kinds of ghosts. And um, you know, to, to call uh, men as fat and cold and women as um, you know, dying in childbirth and then coming back to uh, tempt uh, you know, uh, other men and then children being uh, thrown, killed violently. So, this is not a picture of India that is representative of the truth and we get that in this particular uh, a section um, and which is, which is very, very interesting and disturbing. Now, these and the cops goes, however, are only vernacular articles and do not attack sahibs. Very helpful point once again, uh, probably to the English reader, um, you know, and uh, to reassure him or her um, saying that these uh, ghosts are Indian ghosts who attack only perhaps vernacular Indian people and not the sahibs, the Englishmen. So, the Englishmen are safe from Indian ghosts. If that is the case, if that is the case, why did the narrator at the beginning of the story tell the reader that an Indian ghost had to be treated with a lot of dignity, with a lot of reverence? So, we seem, we seem to have contradictory messages, contradictory messages about Indian ghosts in the story. Why is there such a confusion? Why is there such a contradiction? Again, is a question that has no answer but, and which we might probe. No native ghost, no native ghost has yet been authentically reported to have frightened an Englishman. But many English ghosts have scared the life out of both white and black, um, white and black people. So, the native ghost is powerless to attack an Englishman. So, he reinforces that point, the narrator is, is at pains to reinforce that fact, reassure the Englishman that they need not worry about these vernacular articles, they are vernacular stuff, articles, objects. But many English ghosts have scared the life, they have terrified, frightened, scared the life out of both white and black. So, the English ghosts are all powerful in this hierarchy of ghosts and there again you see that prejudice of Kipling which has become infamous. So, even though this is a story about ghosts and in a story about ghosts all that we get in terms of the information is about ghosts. Uh, the hierarchy and um, the discrimination that we see in the normal society is replicated in this landscape of ghosts too. So, that is what becomes problematic. So, um, that imbalance of power that we see in the regular domain in the normal ordinary everyday walk of life is replicated, mirrored, brought back into this world too. And once again, we have at the top of the pyramid an English ghost scaring, being powerful over everybody else. So, that idea is what is uh, interesting and um, is, is, is something that we need to keep in mind. Now, in the story we have uh, as we have in other gothic stories, a bungalow as the setting, a dark bungalow. What is a dark bungalow? Dark bungalow or dark house or, uh, was a government building in British India under company rule and the Raj. So, it is a government house uh, to be used by uh, administrative officials. In fact, they are rest houses for travellers maintained by the government of India and placed uh, some 10 to 15 miles apart on principal thoroughfares on the major highways you find them every now and then. So, uh, dark is uh, in, in Hindi means post Bangla where Bengali fashion houses. So, they, they were supposed to be very comfortable rest houses for um, administrative officials in the British uh, government. 
So, I have here the dark bungalow in Simla district. Um, this is from 1868. It is a big setup as you can see. Now, the author what he does is um, give us a list of English ghosts too. Um, and, and that is uh, again uh, a list of uh, various um, people who have died in accidents and uh, he mentions all these ghosts as occupying or haunting dark bungalows in various regions. So, just as we have a description of the set of Indian ghosts, we have a companion piece that describes the ghosts uh, um, of um, the English ghosts too. And at the end of that paragraph, we have this statement, the older provinces simply bristle with haunted houses and march phantom armies along their main thoroughfares. Uh, I thought this statement was very significant. What are the older provinces? The older provinces are Madras, Calcutta and Bombay. So, the older provinces are especially overrun with haunted houses. So, that is the point and, and march phantom armies that is very interesting ghostly armies through the uh, main thoroughfares. So, what is this statement uh, about perhaps it is indicating all those battles that the English soldiers had with the native kings and chieftains. So, these uh, phantom armies are the ghosts of those soldiers who died or who participated in all these battles between uh, the company forces and the, uh, uh, and the armies of the local uh, kings and chieftains. So, perhaps it is a reference to that. So, this is the setup of the story. So, it begins with a description of Indian ghosts and then we have the English ghost and then we have we have a dark bungalow. So, that setting is brought into the picture after this premise. Now, the dark bungalows have this very important character called the Khan Sama. Who is the Khan Sama? The Khan Sama in a word is the steward. So, these bungalows, these dark bungalows are objectionable places to put up in. To put up in means to stay. They are generally very old always dirty while the Khan Sama is as ancient as the bungalow. He either chatters senilely or falls into the long trances of age. In both moods he is useless. If you get angry with him, he refers to some sahib dead and buried these 30 years and says that when he was in that sahib service, not a Khan Sama in the province could touch him. Then he jabbers and mows and trembles and fidgets among the dishes and you repent of your irritation. So, we suddenly are introduced to a bungalow, bungalows, dark bungalows in general and a Khan Sama. A Khan Sama as I said is an ancient uh, retainer uh, and these stevers are usually very old uh, and the narrator says that these are objectionable places. You, you object to the condition. These are offensive places in the sense that they are not very well kept up or maintained and both the house and the steward they are always old, always dirty and both are as ancient as each other. So, there is a kind of a, 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 a kind of a collapse of the uh, personality of the bungalow and the, and the Khan Sama, one seems to mirror the other. So, 
uh, he either chatters senilely. So uh, this is a very important characteristic that we need to keep in mind. So his senile perhaps lost his uh, rationality, rational senses, and he falls into long trances, thinks back to the past and talks about it. And if he goes back to this nostalgic condition, he is useless according to the uh, narrator. So the bungalow becomes identifiable with the Khan Sama. It is an interesting equation I would argue because the characteristics of the Khan Sama become, <coughs> become identifiable with the characteristics of the bungalow and uh, both are in a dilapidated state in this particular moment of time in India in this particular story. And the senility that is mentioned there in this uh, passage is very evocative in the sense that we are reminded of other senile old people. Uh, in this course, we have uh, read um, H.G. Wells as the Red Room. And if you remember that story, we have three old people who are caretakers or pensioners of a big castle. Lorraine Castle. The word senile is also used in conjunction with those three people. They are also old, they also ramble and the narrator of that story also has his doubts about their sanity. Likewise, in this particular story, Kipling also has doubts about the um, sanity of the Kansamas who are the caretakers of these dark bungalows of the government. And he says that if these people become nostalgic, they are absolutely useless because they constantly talk about the glories of the past. And this is an important thematic, this very important thematic in this particular story because the glories of the past are the glories of dead and gone sahibs, the Englishmen who were administrators uh, in the past. So the glories are the glories of such Englishmen and these Englishmen are representative of the British Empire. So uh, what Kipling does very carefully in the story is not make the English people glorify the British <coughs> Empire, instead he makes these Kansamas glorify them. That is one interpretation and if you want to uh, do a subaltern reading of this figure of the Kansama, you can argue that these Kansamas are not entirely um, loyal to the British government. They too subvert the British government in their own way and therefore these subalterns are problematic figures who try to um, deconstruct the empire in, in, every, in every minor way possible that is uh, on their hands. So that is one, uh, uh, that is another kind of interpretation that you can do in terms of the role of the subalterns. Now, to come back to this uh, passage, uh, the narrator says that if you get angry with him, he then refers to some sahib and, and, and kind of uh, argues that if that sahib was alive, then he would not be disturbed in this fashion. So here the Khan Sama is trying to get protection for him in the present by associating him, um, by associating himself with these um, past uh, figure, uh, a, a figure from the past, a, a British figure from the past. And then um, the narrator says that it is hopeless, it is pointless to talk to these Kansamas and, and you just have to give up on them and, and you kind of become uh, repentant of your own irritation with them because there is nothing that can be done with these old men uh, who have somehow uh, you know, uh, lost touch with reality. So this is a very complex passage uh, that uh, you can uh, do a, a close reading of and try to figure out what the function of the Kansama is in this particular story. A, he is just a caretaker, literally 
B. He is a figure who is glorifying the empire in an indirect way and Kipling makes the Kansama do that and, and C. The Kansama themselves become problematic figures as you read the story because they also try to subvert the status quo in, in their own way, in their own minor ways. Now this is uh, what is called marble tracery. Um, the windows that allow uh, air to come in, a decorative set of windows that allow the uh, air to come in and some of these dark bungalows have such marble tracery and in this uh, particular story we find Kipling or the narrator bewailing against the uh, role of tracer, uh, marble traceries because they do not keep the cold um, out, in fact they make these places very drafty and again once again. Uh, drafty nature of the rooms is again a gothic motif because if you remember the red room, the candles go out because the room is drafty. making making the place kind of <coughs> inconducive for the benefit of the narrator making the place hostile for the inhabitants. So, um, the common element is the hostility, the hostility of the setting. I would call uh, this a semi domestic space. for the narrators because they are not regular inhabitants of such uh, spaces, they just pass through. So, they are kind of pseudo domestic spaces for these inhabitants slash narrators and such spaces become hostile and we might want to wonder about the hostility of the bungalows. Why is such, uh, such a gothic space hostile towards the inhabitants, towards the two narrators. <coughs> Now, the narrator further goes on to explain his experiences with uh, various kinds of um, figures during his um, you know uh, profession as a British uh, official and he says that it was my good luck to meet all sorts of men from sober travelling missionaries and deserters flying from British regiments to drunken loafers who threw whiskey bottles at all who passed and my still greater good fortune just to escape a maternity case. Seeing that a fair proportion of the tragedy of our lives out here acted itself in dark bungalows, I wondered that I had met no ghost, a ghost that would voluntarily hang about a dark bungalow would be mad of course, but so many men have died mad in dark bungalows that there must be a fair percentage of lunatic ghosts. This passage is interesting because it tells us uh, of a different view of British men who have uh, lived uh, through uh, the Indian. Uh, the Indian government. So, he says that uh, you know there is a range of English people passing through the Indian landscape from the sober travelling missionaries, missionaries who do not get drunk. So, that is one kind of Englishmen or British uh, uh, men who pass through the Indian landscape and then there are deserters flying from British regiments. So, people who do not want to work in the British army and who just you know uh, get up and run away. So, th that is another category of English uh, men who have um, passed through the Indian landscape and then there are drunken loafers you know uh, people who just get drunk, Englishmen who just get drunk and, uh, um, and who kind of attack people who pass by. Uh, so, these are the different kinds of English uh, men that we are introduced to in this story and that is very interesting. We do not just see the powerful British 
uh, administrator uh, who is occupying a very high position in the empire. We see a, a, a cross section of English society too and what we are shown tells us that you know um, even here in this, um, in this ethnic group there is a variety and not all of them are extremely powerful or extremely disciplined. So, and uh, he says that um, deserters flying from British regiments can also be met with during uh, one's travels and this information also tells us that uh, Kipling was very well aware of the various classes of Englishmen and, and uh, it, if you read his biography you will come to know that he was very friendly with the uh, British soldiers too and British uh, soldiers who do not occupy the higher ranks in the army. He was very friendly with them and, and got to know a lot about their lifestyles too. And he says that um, a greater percentage of our lives were acted out in the dark bungalows. It is a very symbolic notion um, and, and it indicates that you know uh, all the lives of these Englishmen are spent traveling and, and these bungalows are the uh, safe havens or the, uh, the, or the rest houses that kind of witness a lot of um, the tragedies and, and the comedies of the uh, lives of these English people. And uh, he says that um, lots of people just go mad and, and that that is the reason why there are a fair percentage of lunatic ghosts. So, um, the idea of madness is again a gothic trope if you remember from the earlier lectures on um, Victorian gothic and, and, and the gothic uh, the classic gothic as well. So, lunacy, senility, dark bungalows are, are all part of the uh, narrative of gothic literature. Now, we have come to this Katmal dark bungalow which is the bungalow which is at the heart of this story uh, my own true ghost story. What is the nature of this particular uh, dark bungalow? Katmal dark bungalow was old and rotten and unrepaired. Again it is very symptomatic of all dark bungalows. The floor was of worn brick, the walls were filthy and the windows were nearly black with grime, it is extremely dirty. It stood on a bypath largely used by native sub deputy assistants of all kinds from finance to forest, but real sahibs were rare. The Khan Sama who was nearly bent double with old age said so. So, this is a very interesting dark bungalow this is especially uh, you know badly kept up, it is especially rotten and the reason is that this is largely used by native sub deputy assistants. So, the majority of the uh, administrators who pass by the officials who pass by uh, or pass through this bungalow are natives not English men and uh, and, and, and who says that? It is the Khan Sama. Khan Sama is the caretaker of this place who was nearly bent double with old age, so extremely old man as well. So, just as the bungalow, the retainer was also very old. So, we, as, as you can see there is a mirroring of the characteristics of the steward with the duck bungalow and, and it, it reminds me of the mirroring of the characteristics of the red room uh, with the characteristics of the old people. Both of them are old, dark and, and pessimistic. So, the people and the space uh, are on the, on the same thematic ideological plane. So, the real sahibs were rare. So, who are the real sahibs? The real sahibs are the Englishmen. So, the Englishmen were rare. So, and this is uh, largely used by native sub deputy assistants and, uh, and that makes this uh, setting very, very complex. So, this English narrator we need to remember 
we have an English narrator occupying this Khatmal uh, dark bungalow and there is another uh, reference which we need to uh, remember about Khatmal it is usually associated with bed bugs. So, something that is not very conducive to a good night's rest uh, in this bungalow. The, da the day shut in and the Khan Sama went to get me food. He did not go through the pretense of calling it Khana, man's victuals. He said Ratub and that means among other things grub, dogs rations. There was no insult in his choice of the term. He had forgotten the other word I suppose. So, again a, a complex set of ideas being communicated through the figure of the Khan Sama. So, the, uh, this English narrator goes to this Katmal Dak bungalow and the Khan Sama goes to get him food. And in, instead of calling the food food, Khana uh, in, in Khana meaning in, in Hindi meaning food, he calls it uh, Ratub and Ratub means grub, something a dog would eat. So, uh, and, and the narrator says that he is not trying to insult me the Khan Sama is not trying to insult me, perhaps he has forgotten the name for food, the proper name for food. So, what do we understand from this viewpoint of the English narrator? One, the Khan Sama is senile, insane. Two, the Khan Sama is uncivilized like dogs perhaps. So, we, we kind of see how um, the Indian populace is described in this particular narrative. Uh, we need to remember that the Khan Sama is the only major Indian uh, figure in the story. So, the Khan Sama becomes representative of the Indian population in the story. And if he becomes representative of the Indian populace, then uh, we need to worry about the way in which uh, he is described through his choice of words, through his language, through his state. So, um, the narrator has a very uh, interesting uh, relationship with this Khan Sama. He has a very interesting way of describing him. Look at the last line. He has forgotten the other word, I suppose. There is no harm um, uh, in his choice of words of calling the food grub. Uh, perhaps he has forgotten. So, perhaps he is, um, you know, uh, innocently barbaric. Uh, that seems to be the, uh, um, that seems to be the subtext to this um, uh, statement. While he was cutting up the dead bodies of animals, I settled myself down after exploring the dark bungalow. There were three rooms beside my own, which was a corner kennel, each giving into the other through dingy white doors fastened with long iron bars. So, uh, you can see in the statement that the metaphor of dog grub is continued here. So, the narrator imagines that the Khan Sama is cutting up the dead bodies of animals as if he is uh, going to feed an animal and not an Englishman. So, that metaphor is carried uh, through in this next statement and while this uh, Khan Sama is doing such a barbaric quote unquote action, this very enlightened narrator settles himself after exploring the dark bungalow. Uh, and uh, I am sure if you have read uh, the red room, you will uh, remember uh, that like that narrator, this English narrator too explores the dark bungalow, make sure that everything is all right. So, that uh, you know uh, scientific attitude to uh, a thorough uh, gathering of information is perhaps also seen in this uh, narrator and he has taken account of the number of rooms that are there in this bungalow besides his own and look at the way in which he calls his room a corner kennel. So, he continues that metaphor of the dog. He imagines himself as a dog who is going to be fed by the Khan Sama. 
So, uh, that metaphor is continued. So, there is a lot of sarcasm here, sarcasm uh, towards the ancient Indian retainer who has been uh, looking after such British officials in their journeys uh, or um, in their journeys across the length and breadth of this country. So, he uh, um, the English narrator has assessed his situation and he realizes that each room gives into another room and every door is fastened with long iron bars and the doors are white uh, in color. So, this is the uh, setting in which he finds himself. Thank you for watching. I will continue in the next session.